Hello, everyone, and welcome to another K6 Office Hours. I'm Nicole van der Hooven, and today Paul Baylog, who's normally with me, is not here. But we do have somebody else with us. Marie, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello. Yeah, so my name is Marie. Um, I'm also a DevRel at K6, and um, I think I've just passed my two months uh, here at K6, so... Really exciting. Oh, wow. Yay. Oh, yeah. Chris and Lee. So uh, I met them both actually during Test Bash um, UK. So it's great that they're both here. <laughs> Hello. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Welcome. So today we were going to talk about web performance, which I think is a, a bit of uh, like a, a fun topic for you to, to do as well, because I know you've done a lot of work in this area. What is it about web performance that that you like or what drew you to it in in the first place? So I think just for some context, so I first started um, learning about web performance when I was still working at my previous, previous employer. So I used to work for a company called News uh, UK and one of the um, initiatives that we had and uh, the project that we were working on was we wanted to optimize one of the websites. So um, it's a um, news website. So, you know, there's a lot of traffic, uh, lots of visitors. So uh, there was a specific project about web performance. And I think that was the first time that I really learned that there's a lot of things to optimize, not just from the back end, but also on the um, on the uh, front end perspective. So it really started from there and then um, trying to uh, really deep um, dive into the tools that we were using. So we were using like a, ver a variety of tools and then learning that, oh, you can actually optimize the website by applying different techniques. So those were all new things to me. So by by being exposed to that project, I was able to gain some knowledge on web performance. So I think that's where it all started. Yeah, I kind of came from a different angle because I I'm more I've done more in the back end performance side. But it's funny because a lot of a lot of the issues like performance issues are first seen on the front end because that's what's visible, right? Yeah. And it's it's also kind of scary because those are the issues that are bound to get noticed more because um, obviously there are some things on the back end that can affect the front end too, but there are so many things that you can take into consideration when you think about web performance. So, I mean, I guess let's start with defining it. Like what even mm -hmm. is web performance? Yeah, I think for me, like the, sim the simplest way that I can explain web performance to someone who doesn't know what it is, is it's basically measuring how fast um a user can see the response that they want so whether that's um instantly or you know whether that's within a couple of seconds so to me it's really the experience of a single user um so it's all about like you said the user experience so typically it always involves a browser because that is what our users interact with whenever they need you know some information or you know some like specific um, um, things that they want to um, like prioritize it it's just always on the browser so it's measuring that user experience and measuring how fast they can um, get the data that they want yeah and and I guess we should also talk about the difference between web performance and like backend performance because that's often what it's compared to. But like yeah. I said, I think that there's some overlap. For instance, any latency on the backend side is probably going to be transferred into the the front end side. You're also going to notice that that network slowness or if there mm -hmm. are some components that have that have difficulty processing requests. That part is also part of web performance, right? Yeah, I think 
like there's there is this um interlink between the two because um like you said if there is any slowness in the back end then ultimately it will be visible um on the front end because it's so it's 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 almost like we're testing the end-to-end -end user experience and to have a full picture you need to know what's going on um at the back end at that and at the same time you also need to know what's happening um on the front end um but i think in terms of like distinct differences so the first thing that i can think of is um the type of metrics that you know we are concerned with so with back-end performance testing mostly we're concerned about like the response times um the error rate um whereas i guess in the front end um, on the front end world we're more concerned about like browser specific metrics like the page load time um but at the same time, it's not just those numbers that are important because there's also the human aspect um, side of things such as, is this actually useful or um, is it like um, interactive yet to our user? So there's also, you know, that um, like side of things that on the, on the back end or on the protocol level, we don't really <laughs> um, measure. Yeah, I think when people say web performance, um, there's an element of it that's the latency, like I mentioned, but then there's also rendering, like how mm -hmm. how quickly things render on that particular device that yeah. isn't something that a backend tool can can measure. But then also, like you already alluded to interactivity, just because something renders doesn't mean you necessarily can can already um, click on buttons or, or interact with it in the way that you're expected to. But I think yeah. the most difficult part of web performance for me is that there's a huge part of it that is all perception. Yeah. Because how fast something actually is does not always translate to how fast people think it is. Yeah, um, it's it's interesting that you say that because I think um, ultimately, like, I know that speed is really important to us. So there's this whole, like, psychology of, like, performance of and performance that we can talk about. But ultimately, it just ends up on... Um, humans don't like to wait <laughs> so <laughs> as a as a like as a great example um let's say you're um waiting for i don't know like you're stuck um in you know in a traffic jam um and if you're not i guess distracting yourself the time just feels longer but if you're um you know distracted or you know you're chatting with someone time does fly you know fast so we have that perception that if something is um boring or something isn't fun then the time takes longer even though it's actually the same amount of time as if you are having fun <laughs> So I was just re-watching some Star Trek uh, episodes and I thought it was really funny. There was one scene where Data, who is an android, I don't know if you've watched Star Trek, but he's, <laughs> he's an android and um, he he is a robot. He's a machine, but he's a team one. And I was seconds. Why do people say that it it takes long when watching they? And it's it's like, we are so irrational as humans because something can take the same amount of time, but our mm -hmm. perception of it can be different each time. And yeah. I know for me, like I will wait longer if there's a progress bar. You know, like having clicking on something and then getting no feedback, even if that if that response delay or perceived delay is is very minimal, I would rather have something that takes longer, but immediately comes up with something that says, hey, processing your request. And then there's like, yeah, you know, you, you see that something is happening. Indicator. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that's that's also related to something that I read because. Um, you know, for example, when we use Slack and something is loading, so they're actually displaying like 
the skeleton of the um, app itself. The um, There's like this message as well that gets displayed at the center while you're still loading Slack. So there's yeah, some yeah. Visual Whereas if nothing is uh, displayed to us, there's no indication that, you know, that it's actually being processed. Uh, we're so impatient that we'll just be, you know, so annoyed. We're just going to maybe close it and then, you know, try to do something else. So visual um, indication, I think, is really important, not just with web performance. So I think we can apply that with like other things, like if you're not being um that um if 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 you don't have some sort of feedback that you know something is happening then you just you know you, you it's not a very good experience at all yeah and what about um the word web in in web performance i think there was a time when that just referred to like being on a desktop and going to yeah. a website but now there's so many other devices to think yeah. about this market is so fragmented yeah. that also affects it right yeah i think um depending on the browsers as well that you use there was a um article that i read um previously that um the performance on each browser it's you know very different so even though um your uh, servers have returned the responses it's it's um it's not um clear as to when it will be shown on a specific browser because each browser has their own um sort of like uh, performance benchmarks um, even if you're using, like you mentioned, mobile device, that also has an impact, different screen resolution. So it's, yeah, it's like, it's 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 now very difficult because there's just so much um, devices that we need to, you know, check. So I think this is why web performance is like um, really, um, I'm not saying it's not, it's not important before, but now we're really seeing that, yeah, like in order for you to be um, still relevant and in, in order for you to not lose any of your customers and then they're just going to go to like your, your competitor, you really need to be fast. <laughs> Yeah, and we're also seeing some changes on th the side of where the logic lies. Like I, I know pre previously when not many people had computers, which seems like a very long time ago, there was a focus on having everything on, on the end device, on the client device, because um, not there weren't that many devices around anyway. And then as people started to go onto the internet and even now our mobile phones can access the internet, then it started to get focused. Uh, the industry, I think, started to mm -hmm. shift more towards thin clients and having logic be on a centralized server. But now the trend seems to be going backwards again, as mm -hmm. uh, you know, that happens a lot in tech where now yeah. we're going back towards a decentralized model because now, like they say, that our mobiles now have enough computing power to have launched, you know, the initial, um, the initial trip to the moon basically uh, so it can now launch rockets so maybe more application logic is being put back on on the devices that's that every time that shift happens that changes mm -hmm. web performance and and user experience and also how we test yeah definitely yeah um so you you've mentioned nicole that like um, in the past, you've always just been, you know, doing back-end performance. So from, like, your perspective, like, how is it, like, really different from, um, like, back-end performance? So, like, I think we've talked about that it's the measure of, like, single-user experience. Um, are there any other sort of differences that you can um, share with us? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, a common... Um, a common statistic like uh, based on the Pareto principle that is thrown out is that 80% of the issues of performance issues are on the front end and 20% are on the back end. And um, I also think though that that doesn't quite um, take into account the, the kinds of issues that we see because I think that mainly because it's also like a single user thing uh, it 
can sometimes be easier to fix front end issues than back end issues, especially because yeah. the back end is so fragmented. We have microservices based ap uh, applications and architectures these days. Yeah, it isn't as easy to pinpoint what exactly went wrong. Whereas because it, the front end performance is focused more on a single user's front end performance, it is easier to track down things because it's all in the one place. Yeah. I mean, w I, I don't know. Would you agree with that? I I, I agree because like when I was doing back end um, performance testing in my previous role, um, we felt that we were doing a lot of trial and error. Whereas when we were doing front end performance, we know that, oh, we have to um, reduce our HTTP requests because the more requests you send, the slower, you know, a page can be. Um, we we know that we have to um, um, reduce or like remove any unwanted CSS or any unwanted JavaScript files. Um, so there's a lot of front end performance improvements that are quite um, straightforward to implement. Like there's like tons of them, but but when it comes to back end performance, um, it's it it was all a trial and error for us. So we were experimenting with. Oh, what happens if we like if we um, bump or if we ramp up to this um, like number of virtual users? Or what happens when we um, expand the duration to a longer time? So we don't see the issue until we're actually experimenting. So I I agree that I think yeah, um, front end performance there's um, um, easier ways to um, like uh, improve the performance as opposed to um, the back end. Yeah, and I also think that maybe there are more, because of that, because it's smaller in scope, there are more guidelines and there yeah. are easier ways to see, like, what is the industry standard for something, whereas the back end, I feel, is, is more mix and match. You know, every yeah. company is going to have a slightly different technical stack. And um, the combinations of that, because, because there are so many different services, it's it's really difficult. That makes it really difficult to draw a comparison from one company to another. Whereas there are a lot of um, front end frameworks that are very popular or are used a lot. But mm -hmm. I guess when when we're thinking about testing web performance, what are it, do you know if if there are any guidelines that you personally go by when when people say? If you knew nothing about about an application, you were just said like you were just asked, what is an acceptable response time from a web performance perspective? Yeah. Okay, what would you say? <laughs> I think you were cutting back, but you're 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 okay now. So is the question what are the recommended uh, speed guidelines? Yes. Yeah. Um. So in like interestingly, um. Um, there was a Twitter connection of mine. Uh, I don't know if he if he's watching, but James, I met him as well during Test Bash, and he asks um, as well the same question: if there is any guidelines or recommendations that we have around acceptable response time. Um, and I think as part of our documentation, we've actually um, like we have a um, a specific um, guideline that you know um, that we're saying. Uh, that there is no clear hard rule, but if you have, I guess, existing, oh, there is, uh, <laughs> James, yeah. So, but if there are existing, like, service level agreements, uh, then you can use that as a uh, benchmark. Um, but at the same time, like, there's this study from uh, Jacob uh, Nielsen, um, and he um, said that, so this doesn't just apply with web performance, but because it's the user experience, um, like sort of um, like measurement, um, it that um, anything that's less than um, one second, or you know, it 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 should be one second or less. That that is the acceptable um, load goal because um, anything more than I guess one second, we actually re um, realize or notice that there is a delay. So if something takes longer than that, then there should be some sort of uh, feedback mechanism, like we talked about a while ago, some sort of like um, like loading or page indicator that you know something is happening, and 
if nothing is happening and that's now exceeded 10 seconds, then the users are left really frustrated. Um, there was another recommendation that let's say when I'm typing uh, on my keyboard, um, I should see that the um, that the um, sort of action is almost uh, instant. So Jacob Nielsen said that that should be less or that should be equivalent to 0 0.1 second, that it should just be really fast. So if we um, relate that in the web, so let's say I'm selecting um, a dropdown and I selected an option from that uh, dropdown, that should just be 0 0.1 second because it should just be very instant uh, feedback. And then the load times, it should be um, as a guideline, one second and anything longer than that, there should be some sort of um, like guidelines or like indication that, you know, something is being processed. That's a good point that when that our perception of performance changes, whether or not where we're actually interacting with something, because yeah, I, I think that's also a reason for client side scripts these days that yeah. there are, there's a proliferation of client side scripts and like single page apps. And that's because of the performance, right? Um, they think yeah. that there are some there are some things that maybe we might be interacting with that are just best being handled in our browsers rather than it having to send off a message to a server somewhere else and that latency might might be slower but also i think that the type of transaction or the feature that it is would have a should have an impact on what do you think the performance should be because mm -hmm. There, there's this weird, um, there's this weird irony where sometimes if something is too fast, that can be a bad thing too. For example, yeah. pay if you are paying for something expensive yeah. <laughs> and it's done in like a few milliseconds, I yeah. would be suspicious <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because. Did that go anywhere actually, or did it just send your credit card information somewhere? Yeah. Because Usually, we know uh, as consumers that there has to be some sort of KYC, like a, a know your customer check to make sure that the credentials are right and that the payment goes through. And so yeah. if it's too fast, that might be bad too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's actually true. Um, the Another example that I can think of is um, if you're just scrolling uh, down and suddenly it's just happening so fast that like you oh yeah it can be a really bad thing because you you don't know like what's happening there's just so many information presented to you at once so there should be a balance mm. as well depending on uh the feature that you are um like trying to implement so what do you do you think that there is any um overlap between web performance and accessibility or do you think that they're really different fields um so i think um, they're, they, they are different in a sense that with accessibility, it has its own goals, performance as well, it has its own goals, but then ultimately both of them contribute to a better user experience. Um, so um, without, I guess, the two, um, you can't really um say to your customers that hey my website you know is really awesome you know because if your website isn't performant but i guess it's accessible then um i don't know if that will still be useful to some because again if something is like really slow then uh e um even if your site is accessible they might still go to um other websites that are accessible but also faster so I think they are sort of um, related in a sense that both of them contributes to a better user experience. Um, but in terms of like the goals, like the different types of tests that we do, there are some um, like differences, definitely. I also think that as an industry, we're moving away from like single 
single requirements. I know when I started, it, it was a single requirement, like X number of seconds for this page, um, that's the response time. But now it feels like we're shifting more towards a range of it. And maybe that's from the SRE world where mm -hmm. we have performance budgets rather than just hard, hard lines. Sometimes those are expressed in terms of a range, like between this, this amount of like one second to two seconds or, mm -hmm. or something. Um, which is a little bit less less specific, but also it's not just response time that you can look at, right? When when we're testing, we can also look at different indexes. Now, are mm -hmm. there some are there some indexes that you use a lot? Uh, when you say indexes, like from the databases or from I was thinking like, like, like um, I know with page this page speed index is one or, or like lighthouse uh, the lighthouse yeah. score yeah yeah so I think so in terms of like the browser performance metrics um, I think the most common um, like metrics that I think most developers know like most um, like testers know it, uh, um, are the core um, web vitals and then there's also other vitals so the core web vitals it's constantly um, like evolving because I think um, as we um, I don't know like um, as the pace of technology progresses, then we also need to um, like um, improve or like evolve the different performance metrics. So I think at the moment um, there are the core web vitals such as largest um, contentful paint, um, cumulative layout shift, um, and also the first um, input delay. Whereas before it was. Um, different metrics like first contentful paint or time to interactive, um, but I I guess um, the these um, vitals are evolving because they are um, like um, figuring out that as uh, technology um, evolves, the there are different metrics that are becoming more and more important um, to users. So the cumulative layout shift is a really great example because when I first started learning about Lighthouse, um, I wasn't even aware of um, cumulative layout shift, but I think now it's considered as one of the important um, um, web vitals. So this is when you are visiting a page, um, but then if there's um, a lot of like visual sort of like modification, so if you're um, reading something, but then suddenly the whole layout just shifted down, then that contributes to a um, a poor user experience. So that's now considered um, a very important web vital, whereas others, um, whereas um, in like previous um uh, versions, um, I don't think this was um, considered as important. So I just brought up Core Web Vitals here as well, just to go into it a little bit more. So here are the three things yeah. that you're talking about. Largest contentful paint, first input delay, and cumulative layout shift. So yeah. it, it's, it's a really good way of splitting up um, what web performance means, like when is loading or or like kind of also rendering, and mm -hmm. the other one is interactivity. interactivity. The other one's visual sta stability. I haven't actually come across this cumulative layout yeah. shift. Yeah. So I think the easiest way for me to explain it is, let's say you're visiting um, a website that has a hero image, but then that hero image um, was loaded quite slowly and so it will push back all oh. of the contents down so then um, if your user is reading something but then suddenly something has popped up then they will lose whatever it is that they are um, reading so they would have to like find it again oh i see yeah that that totally makes sense and it's so specific to our world now where there are different resolutions and we can yeah. flip back and forth between the two um i i actually even just my phone is is a galaxy z fold 3 and yeah. so like it has different resolutions depending on whether it's folded or unfolded and it's so frustrating when a site isn't isn't taking that into account and it's just jumping all over the page that's mm -hmm. uh, yeah 
So that's visual stability. Okay. Yeah. The um, um the um interactivity one. I think that's a really um interesting metric because it shows that if something is presented um to the user, it's also really important that uh we can also measure um how um how interactive it is because if everything is loaded but then um your user can't still i guess interact with a specific button or a specific uh, form then again that's um that can lead to a uh, poor performance which can then lead to poor user uh, experience so it's it's good that they are always um evolving these um, core web vitals so let's let's go and answer this question from Anibal Aguila. Hi, there are some boot camp that cover K6 from scratch without using the K6 cloud. So this isn't specific to web performance, but I thought we should mention it anyway. We are working on on a course kind of like a guided experience, but you can already get a sneak peek. Uh, we're calling it K6 Learn, and I just posted a link in the chat. It is, um, there are a bunch of things in it. There's going to be, there is a starter slide deck if you want to present K6, but also there is like a more guided journey through our documentation starting with performance testing principles. And we do talk about like the difference between back end and front end performance testing as well. So that's a good place to start. Yeah. Um, but going back to, to web performance, we already talked about how to know what's acceptable. I mean, I think most people want a, a straight number. Like, <laughs> no, just tell me, just tell me <laughs> what it should be. <laughs> But it's just so difficult, right? It, it, it really yeah. does depend on on the company and and yeah. the application. I guess I guess uh, um, a guideline that can be quite useful is, um, let's say, if it's quite difficult at the moment to achieve that one second load goal, then maybe you can start. Um, if you go to your competitor's website and you just, you know, measure, I guess, uh, their different performance metrics, and then you just aim to be, I don't know, at least 20% faster, then that can be a good, um, like, starting point. And then once you've reached that, um, don't just stop because uh, performance is a, um, it's, it's not, a like one-off thing so you have to keep on maintaining it so you just have to make like further improvements um and yeah just i guess try to you know keep that number as low as possible but i think yeah starting with looking at your competitors and seeing you know how fast or how slow uh their website is then you can use those numbers um as a benchmark as well and that's a that's a really good tip um, what about what can what about some tips or or best practices for just making websites fast faster in general? Yeah, I think so. I've I've already mentioned a while ago that um, you know it's 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 really important that you try to remove any um, unwanted um like style sheets or any unwanted javascript files that you have so this would be a good opportunity you know for you to um like um work with your team and just look at um how much um at and look at how much files are actually required um another thing that you can possibly do is uh if you just use your developer tools you can look at the network tab um and then if you visit your site um, you can inspect um, how much requests are actually being uh, sent and you can then have a look at each of the different requests see if you know these um, see if these um, individual requests are actually uh, required so if you're making a call to a lot of like third-party scripts is there a way to minimize those because third-party scripts you can't really um, control like, for example, uh, the speed of those. So if there's a way for you to try and reduce them as much, then that's also, um, like, useful. Um, so I think um, I would start uh, looking at those. 
um i remember as well when um i was in this project like we were trying to use uh gzip um like compression as a way to um compress you know our files so it's just basically um a way to make your spa uh, your files like smaller so it's much easier um to process so you can have a look at um how how your um team can also use uh gzip compression um if you have a lot of images then maybe consider um like you know i guess in order for you to still have the best quality you should consider like what's the correct format because i know modern browsers they now support webp which is much more performant um the only caveat is like if you still have users using older browsers webp isn't supported um i don't think um so you have to consider if you're using um the right formats as well um other sort of tips that i can think um you can try to use a CDN or a content uh, delivery network. So if you have, I guess, users from around the world, um, what a CDN will do is it, is it will try to fetch it from the nearest um, server from their location rather than um, getting the request from like other locations, which could be far. And if it's um, far, then that can, um, you know, um, involve a much um, slower um, time. So you can have a look at, you know, implementing some sort of um, like content delivery network that you can use. Um, I think there's some browser caching techniques as well that you can try to use. So if you have a user who's already um, navigated to your page, they don't have to download all of the resources again like your images css javascript because if nothing has changed why would they need to download it again so that can um, totally contribute to a much faster website yeah yeah I think there's that's a, yeah yeah I, I also wanted to mention that you were talking about like um, removing unnecessary style sheets. It seems funny, but as a backend tester, I have come across this a lot <laughs> where there are errors like HTTP 404s that are returned yeah. in my to my um, load testing tool. And when I ask the developers about it, they're like, oh, we didn't know that was still there. That actually oh. happens more than, yeah. <laughs> more than you yeah. might think. But yeah. I wanted to show how to use the dev tools, which is what yeah. you mentioned. So this is in, I think, most modern browsers. I'm just using a, a shortcut here, but you can go yeah. um, here and then more tools and then developer tools. It's free. This is a yeah. great place to start if you like are overwhelmed. And so I'm just on the network tab here, which is what I'm most familiar with. I'm just restart refreshing and doing this on a random on this page that I happen yeah. to be on. And then you can see like what are what are the resources that have been downloaded. And also you get this like waterfall diagram. So I look mm -hmm. a lot at this for um, for backend performance as well. But I know that with with Chrome that you also have this lighthouse tab for generating a lighthouse report. So this is a great way to just uh, profile a, a website really quickly. And it ideally wouldn't be the end all and be all of your performance mm -hmm. tests. But I think it's a great way to just get a feel get for- Get started, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's a lot to be said for, for looking at what these profiling tools tell you off the bat for, for free. Yeah. So here, this is, I wanted to mention, because this is a lot of what you're saying, like reduce unused JavaScript. Yeah. So it, it pointed out some that, that maybe could be removed. There's a lot of good um, best practices that have gone into doing, into putting this together. Yeah. And I think so now that we're on the um, topic of Lighthouse, so I um, actually um, did this as part of my performance testing workshop. And um, what's really great about it is anyone can, you know, just use it because it's like you said, it's free. But I think it's also equally as important that uh, you need to learn what the different metrics are because um, 
the score. Um, don't get too obsessed uh, with the score. What yeah. might be better is if you start um, implementing the different suggestions. So if it says or oh, reduce JavaScript, then you can then you can start from that. But don't be obsessed in trying to achieve like a hundred score because those numbers can be easily manipulated. Yeah, and it's also changing all the time, right? So if you are trying to use it as a as a measure of how your performance has improved, you might find that it decreases as the underlying algorithms are changed. And mm -hmm. it's always being updated with recent industry information. So yeah, I agree, always use it as a guide. So James has a question. Do you test to simulate mm -hmm. cache data or do you prefer testing with removing cache to simulate only new users? Performance testing results yeah. can differ massively depending on choice. Yeah, um, I think for this, you, I mean, you can totally do both because depending on what it is yeah. that you are, you are testing. So if you're testing the experience of a new user, then yep, you would disable the cache. Um, you would run it in like incognito mode as well so that um, any of the stuff that's been saved previously on the browser won't be um, like saved again. So um um, at the same time, if you just want to test, you know, the experience of a returning user. So I think um, you have to do both just um, just so that you can cover both of um, the user experience. Totally agree. And this is also why I like to say the first when when you're in doubt, go back to why you're doing the test. Because if you're, for example, doing a test because you have a new website that nobody's seen before, it's like a new platform yeah. or product, then you should skew your tests towards new users mm -hmm. that don't have a cache yet because that's what you're testing. But yeah. then if you already have an established website, then maybe look at your historical metrics and see how many people are are returning visitors or or ones that have never been there before, I would try to match it with, with those metrics. If you have historical metrics, I think that's the best way to do it. Yeah, I I guess this is more important on the front end, right? Because on the back end, it doesn't really matter if it's the same user, because um, as long as that user is sending like a lot of requests, is that right, Nicole? No, because it would still affect it, because if it's, mm -hmm. if you, um, if if someone has the resources in their cache then they're not their browser isn't making those requests so it is also a, a consideration for back-end back -end. testing yeah so i guess one of those cases of of overlap um mm -hmm. i also wanted to say like with lazy loading um that yeah. might be that's another best practice for uh for just improving your your the performance of a, a website so lazy loading is um basically a way to say which of a certain number of resources are non-blocking or ones that aren't essential to the operation of a web page or or a web app and then basically it's minimization it's like this whole minimalism um trend doesn't just apply to productivity and happiness it applies to <laughs> development as well <laughs> because yeah. you only want to load the the important things and also prioritize the ones that are more important right yeah um funny enough so when we were doing the front-end performance on um that project so i think um we i think um, um initially we went a bit crazy with lazy loading but actually there's um like some guidelines that there are some guidelines as well so don't just lazy load <laughs> like for example all the images um i think you mentioned that if it's like um below uh the user fold so below what the user can see then those are safe to be like lazy loaded because if you lazy load a lot then that can cause a lot of <laughs> Uh, visual movements, which can reduce your cumulative layout shift. Yeah, so just mm. just a fair warning. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a good point because we really we really just care about that initial the, everything that's above the fold. Yeah. 
So everything else can still be loading in the background. But, you know, especially if you're a returning visitor, you might have a different behavioral pattern. If you're a new user, you might actually read more of the front page. But if you've seen this before, maybe you're just going to the home page so that you can quickly click the login button. And in that case, that should be given more priority, like something further down. Yeah, and it's sort of related as well um, to this next point that you should try to show your critical content as quickly um, as possible. Um, so that is also one way of um, optimizing, you know, your website. Um, because if there is already some critical content that, you know, your users can read, uh, then they would, you know, perceive that that page has fully loaded, even though the rest of the page hasn't like fully loaded yet. So yeah, show like critical content um, quickly um, as you can. So what are some metrics that people need to know about when they want to measure web performance? Yeah, I think so. We we've talked about the core web vitals, but I think other metrics that's like really important is um, like the page render time or the page load time. Um, so I think so um, from like a browser perspective, there are two specific ones that I know, which is browser, um, um, which is the DOM content. Uh, loaded and then there's also the browser um, loaded which I think is the more important one because this measures the amount of time that it took for the actual page to load you know um, that means that your user can now um, use that Um, I guess the other important metrics as well so um, we've talked about you know time to interactive so it that measures the time that it takes for um, your page to be fully interactive, which is really important. Um, you should also, I guess, know about total blocking time. So um, to me, that's that's quite an important one because um, if something is blocked, so let's say the browser is trying to process some sort of um, input from your user, um, if if that process is taking more than 50 milliseconds, that is already considered a blocking task. So if that is, let's say, much more longer than your users are, you know, block with doing something else. Um, so it's good to know uh, the measurement for that so you can, um, you know, find a way to reduce um, that number. Um, other metrics as well i think apart from the core web vitals um things like um first contentful paint i think i've already mentioned that uh that that is also important yeah there you go the other i just wanted to (laughs) share some of these um metrics as well here you can you can you talk about what a paint is so a paint is so let's say if we think about pixels like the first paint is like the first pixel that's being rendered on your screen so that's the first sort of um paint or the first pixel that's been um presented so um there's i think if 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 you just want to measure but i don't think this is a, a, a very useful metric. So um, it's not listed here, but uh, they used to have first paint, which basically just measures the amount of time it takes for the very per, uh, for the very first paint um, to be you know presented. But that isn't really um, useful. So the first contentful paint, that's when um, the first, um you know piece of uh content whether that's like an image or whether that's you know something that um can that they can actually start seeing then that is um a good you know measurement because it basically shows um the amount of time that it takes for something whether that's an image or whether that's a text to be uh, visible to your user this is a good sort of timeline of different stages in in the rendering or the painting process. Uh, It's kind of like, it's also very dependent on what you want to look at because for example, this is a Google search, right? And maybe if if your use case was you just want to go to the pictures, this second one would already be enough because you can already click on the images tab. 
But if you wanted to look at this article, um, it would be the third one, not the yeah. second, because there's nothing else here. So it's yeah. it's also interesting that devices that the device that you use will also change how what appears above the fold. It's yeah. just like an added complication. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I guess with this, like uh, um, the the quicker you show the FCP, the quicker as well, you know, the rest of the content will be displayed. So that's why that's also a good metric uh, to know. Yeah. And so um, I also wanted to talk about different ways to, to test web performance because we've we've talked about these sort of profiling tools like Lighthouse and the and in the, the Lighthouse that's in the dev tools in particular. But I saw that this web.dev that had the core web vitals also has um, like a, a, it's kind of like GT metrics. Let me share mm -hmm. again. So I think that there is a way to here measure a site. So you put in your site. This mm -hmm. is, this is uh, very common, right? So what yeah. about these profiling tools? Like what do they not show us? Um, I think for this, so um, so for example, with this um, web.dev slash uh, measure, um, it's just really measuring, let's say, um, a page as it is um, loading. It doesn't really measure, for example, if I'm um, clicking on the button or if I'm typing, you know, on the field. So if I want to measure the actual um, end user experience. So it gives you like this really great metrics, but like what if I want to dig a bit um, a bit deeper and what if I want to measure, okay, if I perform certain actions, um, what's the performance on that as well? I guess this is where performance testing tools come in where you can actually script a, a user flow and then have it be a little bit more interactive and more real than a static assessment of a single web page. Yeah, um, there's also the so so if we're talking about um, other performance testing tools. So if you don't want to script um, within developer tools, there is also the performance tab. Um, so you can record a user journey that you would like to measure and then after you're finished recording it will give you like a raw timeline of data so there's a performance and you can yep you can click the record button and you can perform clicks or, or whatever user journey is that um that you want to do um and then when you click stop then it should give you um a bunch of raw information so my my only um the the only annoying thing that i find with this is so if you're not a performance testing expert um you know if you just really want something easier to digest this isn't um a developer or, or this isn't, <laughs> like very user friendly because there's a lot of data <laughs> yeah but like i guess if you're um if you want um, a much more, you know, in-depth um, measurement, then uh, this is a perfect way to start. Um, I believe they've released um, a sort of new feature called Performance Insights, but that depends on um, if you're on the latest um, um, Chrome um, version. Um, so Performance Insights, um, I think if you press... Where is that? The, so, you know, beside recorder, there's um, like an arrow icon. So you've got performance, memory, application, security, lighthouse, recorder. And then there's that icon there. Yeah, oh. so if you click performance insights. Um, so it's the same thing as performance. You can click the record button. Um, oh, this you, is really good too because you can yeah. simulate like mobile networks. Yeah, or, networks. Yeah. yeah. You can disable the cache as well. Um, and you have an option if you want to record. And if you just perform like different, you know, button clicks or like a specific user flow, um, their aim is to provide a much more better user experience than the performance um, feature. Mm, 
Okay, that's interesting. I didn't know about this performance insights. You know what other tool has performance insights? <laughs> K6 <laughs> <Yeah>. Cloud. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that there was a, a performance insights, yeah. but yeah, wouldn't it be cool if our performance insights also did front end stuff? Because right now it does yeah. back end stuff, which yeah. is pretty awesome too. Yeah. But okay, yeah. this so is you've got you've nice. got like a timeline there, and if for example mm. there's information about long toss, so you can click on um, a long toss, and that will give you an insight as to what is the long toss. And it gives you like other details, but this is still like an experimental um, feature, but it's um, supposed to be much more user friendly uh, than the performance tab. So if you're not um, a massive performance testing expert and you just want something like really quick, or if um, you just want some more insights or some more suggestions on how you can improve the performance, uh, then yeah, that's, 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 uh, that's an option. Yeah, there are also two other things, two other ways that I wanted to mention, because there's test tools like like um, XK6 Browser or, or Puppeteer or Playwright, but there's also synth synthetic monitoring and then RUM or real user monitoring tools. So what, what are the differences between those? Yeah, I think so. If if we're I guess talking about like synthetic and real, so um, so for example, with Lighthouse, they're using lab data, so this isn't really real data. Whereas I believe um, Page Speed tests, uh, they use like actual real data that Google has collected anonymously from different users from different network conditions. So it's much more um, it much. Um, it's much more, I guess, um, uh, real uh, rather than just using lab data. So I guess with with that, those are like the differences. And with, for example, with real user monitoring, if you've got, um, you know, dashboards in place, you can monitor like, you know, how they are um, using um, your website and what is their like response times, then uh, those are considered uh, real user monitoring, like you're actually monitoring in production. Yeah, and I think they both have their uses, right? There are some things that you maybe don't want to look at from a real user monitoring perspective, just from a privacy point of view that you can yeah. do with synthetic monitoring. And I guess ideally you would have both of them in place and also use a more scriptable test tool to have a holistic view of web performance. Yeah. Um, uh, there's I guess, also this. Yeah. Yep. Go on. Um, I guess just um, to sort of mesh, um, to sort of mention as also you you mentioned XK6 browser um, as another tool. Um, so we we are currently um, trying to do a lot of you know browser based performance tests as well. Um, we have like previous episodes of K6 Office Hours, which you know talks about browser based performance testing. But yeah, XK6 Browser. If 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 you want a much more I guess a scripted way of um, you know finding like what the different performance metrics, um, then that is an option. Um, I did discuss uh, uh, with you know the team as to what performance metrics are we actually going to measure because we still need to, I guess, fully agree on what is important um, to us and to our users. Yeah, it's hard because, I mean, you could put all of them in, but then you get something like what we what we were looking at where you, there's just so much data and you yeah. don't really know if you're a beginner where to even start. So, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult topic. But... <laughs> What can they, what, what resources do you have? If someone wants to get more into web performance, do you have any, any sites or books or, or videos or anything that you could recommend? Um, I think um, web.dev um, is a really great start. So they, um, you know, post a lot about like the different metrics, some, you know, best practices. Um, um, MDN um, docs as well, you know, from our, from you know Firefox. I think they've yeah. got some really excellent um, resources. 
um podcast um the only podcast that i can think of that because i've i've been listening to him is um joe call antonio's um performance um testing podcast um and there's a bunch of like really useful um episodes out there um about web performance um as well um apart from that which ones have i have i used I like um, uh, Steve Souders' books. Uh, yes, They're yeah. a little dated, but I think that the principles are still nice. solid, which is the, the test of a, a good book, right? Uh, he has, yeah. um, what is it called? I know the the second was is even faster websites. I think the first one is faster high websites. High, high, performance high performance websites. websites. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I like both of those. It's how I got started in, in web performance in particular because he, he does more on the front end. Uh, yeah. I'll put his name in the, in the comments as well. Um, but that's, that's great, Marie. Uh, thank you for, for coming on to talk to us about this. I think we, we should have you back. I, there's, this, there's so much more to talk about. Like we barely scratched the surface with the metrics as well, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah, this is um, one of those topics that, yeah, will constantly um, just evolve, like, just like, you know, the um, core web vitals will also evolve. So we yeah. just... Yeah, have to uh, keep talking about it. So uh, that's how we continuously learn about web performance. Well, great. So thank you for joining me today. And thank you, everybody who's who's watching and who will watch it in the future. Have a great weekend. And I guess we'll see you next week. Yeah, see you. Bye. Thank you all.